Hey guys, welcome back to Awakening with Ali. I have such a special guest with me today, you guys. You're going to love this episode. And I have my son making an appearance. So if you guys hear me mute, you know mom life. So I have the amazing Aaron Abke, who is a paradigm shifting spiritual teacher. He delivers a fresh new perspective on self-realization through his teachings on the law of one, non-duality and spiritual intelligence. And Aaron aims to provide humanity with the tools, knowledge, and practices needed to aid our collective ascension to enlightenment or fourth density consciousness. His passion and purpose is to awaken the planet to the awareness of our oneness and collective destiny as an enlightened civilization. And you guys, we're going to learn all things about Aaron. We just did a live on Instagram, so I will link that here so you guys can go watch and learn. But I'm going to meet myself and let Aaron tell me a little bit about him for you guys. And Aaron, go ahead and just start on your journey of how you got here and break it down. And let's start with what you talked about with religion and kind of how, you know, you walked away and how you've come to this beautiful space of what you're teaching now. Sure thing. So uh, if you haven't heard my backstory before, I grew up as a pastor's kid, evangelical pastor's kid, and was a very devout Christian, you know, loved Jesus with all my heart, wanted to be a pastor like my dad. So I was going down the Christian route for my first 23 years of life and then uh, started having questions around 18 and just kind of bottling them inside. And it was at 23 years old when I graduated from Oral Roberts University with a degree in music and theology. I was ready to go start my ministry career, and then all of a sudden, just the existential crisis within couldn't be buried any longer, and it just came erupting out in a very ferocious way, and I, I found myself being very bitter towards Christians all of a sudden and feeling all this uh, just internal conflict about my faith I, I couldn't deal with any longer, so I had to sort of honor the process happening within me and say, look, guys, I don't believe this stuff anymore. I don't believe in this version of God you're selling me. And so I had to blow up my life and leave everything behind. Um, every friend I had or had ever had was a Christian. My All my family members from both sides are all Christians. I was married at the time. And um, my, my ex-wife and I took about three years to finally, before we divorced and ended the marriage. Because as soon as I started leaving the faith, she, she tried to go with me, but we kind of did this spiritually. And so it was clear that it just wasn't going to be a match long term. So I got divorced by 26 and I moved back in to my parents' house in California to start my whole life over. And I kind of knew like I'm going to be called a heretic, a cult leader, all these different labels that Christians call anybody who backslides right out of the faith. And that was what was really hard for me to accept to get me to the point to openly acknowledge to people that I didn't believe this anymore was getting over that hurdle of like, I'm going to lose every single friend I have. Most of my family will probably never talk to me again. And you might be like, well, that's pretty intense, Aaron. Like, are you sure it would be that extreme? And uh, at the time, you know, when you're, when you're in a cult, so to speak, you can feel the energetic repercussions coming at you because it's all this, from the time you've been in the, whether religion, cult, whatever you want to call it, you've been under this kind of energetic brainwashing system that we're, we're taught what to believe, we're told what to believe. And if you don't believe it, you're bad for these reasons and you're going to hell and blah, blah, blah. So you know that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot to be given up by leaving your faith. And there's going to be a lot of defensiveness towards the people who are still in the faith because you're basically questioning their whole framework of reality. You know, you're calling into question everything they believe and who wants to admit everything I believe is a lie. And all my life I've been living a lie. It's not something the ego wants to admit, right? So you're going to provoke anger in people when you question those things that they don't want to question. So I knew all of that. And um, my assumption was correct. I lost every single friend I had, um, got what you might call backstabbed by some of my absolute closest friends. Um Everyone except for my father, mother, and sister uh, to this day do not speak to me. They consider me a heretic. So everything I expected happened. But the beautiful thing was when you're willing to be authentic to your truth and to not suppress what you're feeling and thinking anymore, there's a beautiful freedom that comes from that. And when you find it, it's like, I'll give up anything for this. I'll lay down any treasure to have this inner peace of knowing that my heart's in integrity. And I am 
doing my absolute best to honor the truth. And it's only by honoring truth does the truth actually reveal itself to us. If we want to be in a rigid belief system, truth is happy to let us be in that belief system. It's not going to come pounding on your door and force you to to give up your belief system when you're not ready to. So yeah, that was my early journey in my in my 20s. And then from there, things just progressed as my own spiritual journey unfolded, uh, sort of as we talked about on the Instagram live. It just, God just kind of took me on a journey of self-actualization through exploring every world religion and all these different perspectives of the divine really just brought me back full circle to the um, Christ consciousness and what that really means. And so that's uh, a large part of what I teach now on my channel. Wow. What a journey. Thank you so much for being so vulnerable to share. When you spoke to that darkness, I could feel that so deeply from my own journey of coming out of being in the Hollywood world, totally different thing, but Hollywood world and a celebrity wardrobe stylist and knowing yeah. all that and then speaking out and, you know, waking up to so many different things that were going on and, and mm -hmm. the truth of them and everyone like, what's wrong with you? And what are you talking about? And, you know, and, and you're crazy and your conspiracy and all these things and family and friends and so many that I let go of. And, and so thank you for sharing that because I think so many can experience that and can feel so alone. And I'm curious for you, Aaron, before you found that true freedom and that sovereignty, when you were in that darkness, when you were in that place where it was like, wow, I know I'm speaking my truth. I know this is right for me, but like I'm losing everything. What was that like for you? And how did you get through it to get to the other side of what you just spoke to, which is the beauty of finding the freedom, finding the sovereignty, this real beautiful inner peace, this treasure now that you have and the life that you, that you built and what you get to do now to serve. Well, uh, I was given a pretty gracious gift from the creator along my dark night of the soul. in that I had probably, I want to say like about four years of really intense depression because when you come out of a religion, cult, whatever you want to call it, an old framework of reality that gets uh, subverted all of a sudden it's it, only if you've left a religion or a cult, do you really understand what it's like? Uh, it's incredibly disorienting and it can cause a lot of real psychological problems to unravel um, repressed traumas, fears, all this stuff will come running to the surface to be seen because now you don't have a certainty to cling to, right. To avoid facing the darkness within. So all the darkness will come up. And it's like, what is true? Is there even a God? Does love exist? Well, what happens when I die? Is it just eternal annihilation? I'll never see my mom again. Like all these dark feelings and questions started coming up. And it was like that for about four years of just tremendous, tremendous suffering that I didn't know how to escape because on the surface layer, people would say, oh, this guy's got it all. He's a, a signed fitness model. He's a competitive bodybuilder. He um, works at Google. He's got a great job. Like, what does this guy have a reason to be depressed about? And of course, inwardly, I was massively depressed and, you know, struggling with suicidal thoughts all the time. And I just thought to myself, like, if I can't figure out how to get out of this depression and find real peace, uh, life is totally not worth living like this. So I used my suffering as motivation, which is what suffering really is. It's our motivation for seeking. But through all that intense seeking, you know, I was reading enlightenment texts all the time, listening to teachers like Eckhart Tolle and Alan Watts. And I was 27, maybe 28, can't remember. It was in um, August of 2017. I At this time in my life, I was going up to a balcony above my gym that I worked at and I would just kind of sit back and have my lunch and listen to an Eckhart Tolle lecture. And that was the only time of the day where I had real peace from my, my thoughts and my depression. So I really looked forward to my lunch break every day. And one day I was listening to a lecture on my lunch break and, you know, maybe the planets just aligned or something, but Eckhart Tolle was sort of like mimicking things that our ego says to us, such as, if only people would recognize how special I am, then I would truly be happy and things like that. And I recognized, oh yeah, that's totally what my inner voice is saying all the time. And I started laughing each time Eckhart would speak one of these things, he would chuckle and the audience would laugh and I would laugh. 
So I was really getting into this flow of like, oh, he's nailing it, man. That's totally what my ego says. And, you know, like the fourth or fifth one, um, I sort of laughed myself into a realization of oneness in that, you know, laughter can be a really powerful way to realize something. And that's kind of what it did for me was to laugh at my ego for the first time caused these doors to fling open or something. And it was like I was permitted into another realm and a curtain was pulled back on reality. And I saw the magnificent truth of reality, which is oneness and unity in that there is no separation from God. There is no other entity to be feared other than God and God is perfect love. All these things that I had heard and read and could speak about, but had no direct experience of all at once just became a living reality. And I was just in silent awe of the perfection of reality all around me. And so I kind of floated down from the balcony to my gym to train my next client and just hardly even knew what was going on. It was like I was in a different universe or something. I was just indescribably happy. And my client even commented on it when he saw me. He was like, wow, Aaron, you look really happy today. And I was just like, yeah, I am really happy. So I, I stayed in that state of absolute bliss from the realization of oneness for two full weeks. And then it was two weeks to the day that I woke up and looked at my phone to look at the time. And I saw the, the date that it was two full weeks after that experience. And here I am still feeling full of bliss and joy. And so that was when the first thought of ego really came back online. And the thought was something to the effect of, wow, I've been in this state for two whole weeks. I wonder if I'm enlightened. Just like that. And I didn't catch it because it was such a wonderful thought. Maybe this is enlightenment. You know, wow, maybe enlightenment has happened to me. And uh, innocently went on about my day, but noticed that the mind was starting to come back online and some of those old thoughts, fears, depressions, whatever, all started reappearing again. And I was kind of like, oh no, is my ego coming back? And so I didn't know how to stop that process of the ego coming back because I didn't even really understand what the ego was um, to a large extent. So long story short, I eventually was right back into my dark night of the soul but this time it was even worse than before because I had had a taste of heaven now for two full weeks and then it and then got thrown back into hell again. So it's like, how much worse does that prison cell feel once you've spent two weeks in the king's palace getting fed grapes and stuff and then you're thrown back in the dusty dungeon? It makes it a whole lot worse, right, with that perspective because now I know what's available and what I'm missing out on. But that was the gift that I mentioned that the universe gave me was that that insufferable inability to accept the dark night of the soul any longer, knowing what heavenly reality is available. It gave me this, this absolute feverish burning passion to get back to that state, no matter what it took. And so at the time I, I mentioned, I was a, a full-time fitness model in San Francisco doing shoots on the weekend and stuff. I was a competitive bodybuilder. I was actually scheduled to go to nationals in Las Vegas. And I just sort of like walked out of my life and quit everything all at once. I called, called up my agent, quit my modeling gig, dropped out of my bodybuilding show and just devoted all my free time to spiritual seeking. And that's when things really started to pick up on the ascension path was that because I was so desperate for answers, I think when, when, you, when your heart really longs to know the truth, the universe loves to give you the truth. You know, it, it loves a hungry seeker. And that's what I was blessed with was a lot of spiritual hunger. And so out of that journey of returning back to that state of unity consciousness, you know, that every, every lesson learned, every concept integrated is, you know, became my YouTube channel. I would just make YouTube videos about all the things that were transforming in my consciousness and the realizations I was coming to about what is enlightenment and how is it actualized in the human? And so I was able to put things in a way that people reflected back, helped them understand complex concepts about enlightenment and ego and things in a very simple way. And so that was another gift that the universe gave me through that suffering. So just like we said on our Instagram live, your pain becomes your purpose. Absolutely. 
Yeah, that's really powerful. And thank you for sharing that. And I love that you said like, once you were in that bliss and you, you know, found that true enlightenment, that true inner peace, it was like, oh, how do I get back here? And I also really appreciate that you spoke to how you went back into the darkness of the soul. Cause I also too went there as well. And I think many of us do, and we don't expect to, because we feel like, oh, I, I up leveled, right? Like I got mm-hmm. to the next level. So why am I all of a sudden going back? And you're right. It's so much darker. It's so much deeper. And I love that you said, like you had this like yearning, this feverish, like I have to get back to that bliss. I have to get back to where I was. So mm-hmm. when you were in that darkness of the soul again, and you were back in that place and it was even deeper and even darker, what was it besides the, the passion and the fever and, you know, the hunger to get back to where you found that inner peace and that true love for yourself, really, that's what it is, right? And just love for the collective and oneness. What was it that got you there and now obviously has kept you there because now you are teaching this work and sharing it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, great question. So the the real like golden nugget that came out of the journey back out of separation, back into unity was what I call the three beliefs of ego. Uh, this is what I teach on my YouTube channel in my courses really heavily. And um, we really drill down into this teaching, but to give you a summary of it, I started to ask myself the really important questions of like, okay, so what is it at the core? There's got to be an underlying core to this suffering, like a a belief or something that's underlying it all, that if I can just get to that and uproot that, the whole thing will go. And so in wanting to know what are the, you know, fundamental beliefs that I suffer from, I started to ask myself things like, well, what do I really suffer from? Like emotionally, what do I feel every day? And I came down to the conclusion that there's only, there's really just three negative emotions we ever suffer from. And there's lots of different variations of them, but it's just three kind of root emotions, which are sadness, anger, and fear. Sadness, anger, fear. And there's a ton of varieties and flavors of those, but that root is underlying every negative emotion we feel. And uh, for the listeners, I use these terms very loosely because I'm so used to using them with my members and students. But when I say the word negative, I don't mean bad or wrong. I mean constricting. And if I use the word positive, I don't mean good or right. I mean expanding. So a positive emotion is an emotion that feels expansive. And a negative emotion is one that makes you feel constricted or contracted. So it's just like polarity, right? Positive is radiating. Negative is absorbing or magnetic. So there's only three negative emotions. And those three negative emotions correlate to our lower three chakras, Most people know that the lower three chakras are kind of what makes up ego. So we have the red, orange, yellow, root, sacral, solar plexus. So those three emotions correlate to the three lower chakras. And so I started to think over time, well, if it's just one of those three negative emotions that I suffer from, then there has to be a reason why I suffer from each one of them. Yeah. Like there's a reason why I feel sad instead of angry or or afraid there's different reasons so what are they so as i started to be more convinced that there are like three underlying beliefs we could call them the three beliefs of ego what are they i want to know and that intention to know caused the universe to start showing me within myself and throughout my life like oh this is what belief causes sadness and so the first belief of the ego is the foundation for all three and it's the the belief that causes sadness And it's the belief that I am lacking. That's it. I am lacking. There is lack. I lack something. I am incomplete. I am insufficient. I am inadequate in some way. There's something just missing about me. I'm not complete. That's the first belief of ego. And so anytime you're sad, whether you're depressed, lonely, you feel hopeless, any variation of sadness, it's always a lack belief. You feel you're lacking love, you feel you're lacking companionship, whatever it is. And so once I understood that the first belief is the belief in lack, which causes sadness, I was able to start seeing what the second belief is because all three of these beliefs play into each other. They all connect to each other. So if I am lacking, that implies that I could perhaps fulfill my lack somehow in the world. 
And that's the second belief of ego, which I like to summarize it as my happiness depends on outcomes, on external things. So I got to go fulfill myself in the world. Yeah. The world has my lack, whatever I'm lacking, it's out there and I can go get it. And so that's the belief that we could summarize it as attachments or, you know, personal desires. The Buddha said, you suffer because you desire. It's uh, the belief that something outside of me can fulfill me. That's the second belief. And that belief causes anger because anytime a goal gets blocked or the outcome we want gets blocked, whenever we don't get what we want, anger is the result. So then, okay, that's the second belief. What's the third one that causes fear? And this one took a little bit more time to see because it's it's probably the sneakiest and most subversive of the three, which is basically the belief in personal doership or personal control. So if I can go out and fulfill myself in the world, if I can go win pleasurable outcomes that will complete my lack that implies that I'm the doer of my actions. I'm a separate entity that acts and behaves apart from the universe. I'm in control of my life and my actions. I'm the doer. I'm going to go do it. I'm going to fulfill myself. So that sounds like an, an obvious given that you're the doer, but actually what it is is a denial of oneness because in a universe of absolute oneness and unity and connection and relationship you know everything exists in relationship everything depends on everything else there are no independent actors in the universe right whatever you do like even for me to move my hands while i'm talking i'm depending on billions of mitochondria and my cells and we can go on and on and on my heart needs to beat my lungs need to breathe and here i am so arrogantly thinking that i'm doing actions by myself so it's like, you're not in control. You are being lived by life. You know, the one power of life is actually living you and moving you. My karma is moving me, my defense mechanisms, the things I haven't healed, all of that's influencing my decisions. So to really accept, like, I'm not in control of my actions. I'm not in control of my life. I can't make the gears of reality turn how I want them to. And any degree I resist life or try to stop life from what it's doing, I bring more negative karma onto myself and I suffer even more. So that's the third belief, which is really hard to see for most people, but that's the belief that causes fear because fear is basically the belief that we are losing control or don't have control. When somebody has a panic attack or an anxiety attack, it's always because they think they're losing control of something, right? I can't breathe, or I don't know where I am, or there's not enough space in here. There's something they can't control, and it's causing this panic in the mind. So fear is the belief that you're in control and losing that control. And so that made sense to me. It's like ding, 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 light bulb went on. So the big connection for me was that if those three emotions are always signaling one of those three beliefs, well, then what I should probably start doing is paying attention to when I feel those beliefs and going right to the belief itself. So when I feel sad, uh, I'm going to take that as a cue from my emotional guidance system that the mind is believing in lack and I need to lovingly correct that belief. Or if I feel angry, the emotional guidance system is saying, hey, your mind has an attachment on a pedestal somewhere. You need to take that attachment off the pedestal if you want to be free. Or if I'm afraid, hey, your mind believes it's in control of something, you need to lovingly remind the ego that it isn't in control and that God's in control, right? So I started doing this all the time. Just go to the belief, go to the belief, go to the belief and lovingly correct it with, I came up with like my own truth statements, um, which I give in my masterclass. I'll, I'll just give one example for the belief in lack. Whenever I'm sad, uh, the correction I would start to give myself is um, actually a a line from A Course in Miracles, which just has the best like truth affirmations you'll ever find. And it says, only what I have not given can ever be lacking. And I really started to connect with that truth in, in the course that says, you are the source of everything. You are the source of all love, of all happiness, of all peace. But because you're the source and there is no love outside of you, You'll never see or know your love unless you give it. 
right? So the giving, the extending of love outside is actually what causes us to realize it in ourselves. It's actually in the giving of love that we realize love rather than trying to get it from everybody. You know, somebody please love me. Somebody approve of me. You'll never get love like that. It's because it's implying lack, right? And you're just increasing your lack belief. So what you give out to others is what you increase in yourself. And it was like, oh yeah, I guess that's been a big part of my problem is that I'm so concerned with Aaron and Aaron's stories and Aaron's depression. I hardly even think about others. I hardly even care about other people's suffering. And so whatever I, whenever I think I'm lacking love, that's a call to remember that I'm not giving love. So I would literally just start going out and maybe I just give love to the tree in my front yard. If nobody's around, you know, give love to the, the ladybug or something, give love to creation, if nothing else. But if there's somebody, an actual person that you can serve and give love to, that's the best medicine for healing. So I would do that as well whenever I could, but just practicing that truth in the presence of the ego's belief, like when I am actually depressed, that's the moment to go out and love people. Like get beyond yourself, stop being stuck in your tiny frame of reference and making it all about you. If you just give love to anything, that love will be like the medicine that you swallow that will heal you, right? I love that you spoke to that because love is the highest frequency there is, right? Like you said, like get out of your own way, get out of the stuckness, right? Which is what the matrix does to us is like get us stuck in so many ways or gets us busy and caught up on things right. that we want to be caught up in. And I love that you said like, get out of that stuckness and go give that love because love is the highest frequency. And it's like, I tell like even my clients and everything, like love is going to change your life. Like whether you recognize it or not, or you feel loving in that moment, I love that you said like, get out of your own way to move into that and allow that. And I also love that you spoke to the ego so beautifully too, because I took a course called how to be happy. And it was all about turning off the ego with Amelia love who was mm -hmm. a teacher. And I learned all about that it was like literally turning off the ego and allowing myself to see beyond that and those beliefs. And I love how you've created that with those three emotions. I think anybody on their journey, whether they even, you know, awaken fully or not can recognize, Oh, I have fear. Oh, I have anger. Oh, I've been depressed or I'm there right now. And knowing that, mm -hmm. like you said, you can lovingly correct that and then actually yeah. move through that and, and move forward. My son's agreeing. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I know we have to wrap things up here soon and he's going to babble. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I want to ask you before we wrap things up, obviously you're doing your teachings. Obviously you're sharing what you've learned. What would you say when it comes to someone who is kind of just stepping into this journey and they know all these things, but they're having a really hard time implementing them and allowing themselves to actually move forward? Because I believe from seeing all you share, what you talk about and the law of one and everything, you really want to help those who are kind of moving the goalposts forward. They're ready to, to move. They're ready to help. They're ready to shift. They're ready to serve because that's where we are in the collective. That's where we are going. We are ascending. So what would you say to someone who they've kind of gotten this knowledge, they've done some practices, you know, they're, they're diving in, but they're feeling like they can't move forward. They're, they're, they're in that stuckness that you spoke to. They're not in the dark night of the soul, but they're still in that awakening where they're trying to, you know, get going forward where you were, I guess, four or five years ago before you started really allowing yourself to fully be in the space. Cause like you spoke to, you did the YouTubes and you shared from your heart because of what, you know, you were needing an outlet. But now, obviously, where you are now is a completely different space. So what would you say to someone who maybe is really trying to figure out how do I take this amazing information and these teachers and all I'm listening to and learning and implement and move forward so I can walk into my greatest life and have that inner peace and what it looks like? Mm -hmm. Fantastic question. So, you know, if if I could like go back or speak to my former self six, seven, eight years ago, whatever that would be who is starting to come out of that dark night of the soul and give myself advice on how to really accelerate the spiritual path, it would be very different than the actual route I took, which is that, again, I spent most of my time studying enlightenment texts and teachings and trying to practice being the observer and stuff, which all is great and all is very beneficial. So don't get me wrong on that. But there's just something so incredibly powerful, spiritually speaking, about what 
what we might call right action, meaning strive with all of your heart to live in unwavering integrity. Be consider yourself like a monk who won't even hurt a fly, you know, and live like that to where you are trying to walk a path of absolute kindness and acceptance of all and always telling the truth, never speaking a lie, always looking who you can serve. And these practices of like right action, mindfulness, they are so powerful for canceling the ego sense because ego is all about me, 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 me. And when it's all about me, I want to tell people whatever will get them to approve of me. If, if that's a lie, no problem. Like if I need to step over somebody to get my outcome, no problem. Ego lives selfishly. And so by radically living unselfishly, it just destroys the ego's stronghold over your mind so quickly because between the three um, sort of modes of being that we have available, we have thoughts, we have emotions, and we have actions. These are the three ways we can operate in time space in a body. So we know that thoughts have power and that all thought is creative and will create on its own level in some way. And so that's, you know, law of attraction, manifestation 101. But what does law of attraction teaching say? They say, if you can actually feel your desire, even more powerful, right? You're sending this really powerful cue to the universe of what you want. So emotions are even more powerful uh, for manifestation than thoughts are. But what's more powerful than emotions? Actions. When you act on what you want, it is the most karmically powerful thing you can do to send that signal out to the universe of this is what I want. And if it's a certain state of being you want to create, meaning I want to become egoless, I want to become peaceful, I want a quiet mind that's full of the love of God, how do you get there? Act like you're there. What does a person who has full enlightenment do? Well, they always tell the truth. They always look for who they can bless and who they can serve. They don't hurt a fly. They walk with kindness and forgiveness and compassion. So it's like, hey, maybe focus more on living with that unwavering integrity and righteousness and making every action pure, as pure as possible. Uh, and when you do misstep, ask for forgiveness, you know, like be like a monk that lives this way. When you, when you make that your primary spiritual practice, you're like on a rocket ship to enlightenment because again, actions carry the most karmic punch to them. Ego doesn't want you to think about the truth. Ego really doesn't want you to feel the truth, but it really <laughs> doesn't want you to act on the truth. You know, it doesn't want you to behave according to truth. Because it wants you to be the actor for its thought system of selfishness and greed and pride and deceit. And so when you disavow those qualities by doing the exact opposite of whatever is selfish, selflessness, open-heartedness, it's just incredibly powerful for transforming your state of consciousness. And I think it's something that people on the spiritual path usually take a long time to come to, right? To see the value of it. Because we, we have so much knowledge and information available, we can go on YouTube, we can watch millions of videos, we can read millions of books and gain so much knowledge, but it's really the embodiment of the knowledge that transforms our state of consciousness, and that embodiment is the right action, right? If your heart is full of love, nobody has to wonder because they'll see it in your behavior. They'll feel it from your energy. When you're around them, they'll leave being like, wow, that was such a, a kind, loving person. And that's what right action does. So the way that I teach this framework in my master classes is I said earlier that everything exists in relationship. If you understand that the whole universe is a system of relationships, that's what oneness means. So enlightenment can really be summarized as being in loving relationship to everything. So we use this framework in my 4D university program of loving relationships. And it's just the most powerful framework I've ever found in all spiritual traditions for really integrating oneness as fast as possible to begin seeing that everything is in relationship. You're in relationship to every thought you have, every feeling you have, 
every person, every moment. There's just relationships happening everywhere. And so if you just say, hey, since everything exists in relationship, I just need to practice always being in loving relationship. And so you practice that and that's the right action that comes out, right? You, you behave with kindness towards all living beings. You want to serve and bless other living beings because loving relationship is your one framework for everything. So when your mind is thinking, you know, troubling thoughts, rather than being like, oh, stupid ego, would you just go away? I'm going to go meditate so you'll shut up. That's not a loving relationship to your mind, right? That's kind of an abusive relationship, but we all do it very, very subversively. So instead you start to tune into going, oh, I've been in a kind of unloving relationship with my thoughts. So let me give love to those thoughts and forgive them and say, it's okay to be busy and noisy right now. There's no judgment in that. And I'll love you just as you are, thoughts. Uh, you start doing that with your thoughts, with your feelings, with your neighbor, with your parents, with your partner, with your children. And it just, that loving relationship framework, it just flows out into everything, Ali. It's like, the one medicine for everything that solves all problems, if you refuse to ever participate in an unloving relationship, you are enlightened. That's the state of enlightenment, absolute unity consciousness. And so to me, that framework of relationships, uh, being in loving relationship to everything just really creates right action kind of naturally and automatically as an outflow. Yeah, that's beautifully said. And I love that you said too about the whole in a loving relationship, like how that's to be seen as everything, not just like your parents, not just your kids, not just your partner. It's like everything around you and recognizing like you're also putting out that message, that frequency. And you're right. When you walk into a room or you listen to a conversation, you're drawn in because you feel the energy and you feel the embodiment that you spoke to and you actually receive it. And there's no question versus when you are around someone and it maybe feels fake or you notice right away in your gut that like, oh, I don't know, this feels off. I don't want to, you know, engage with this person that much or I don't like the energy of the room. We are energetic beings. And like when you mm -hmm. can understand that and receive that, you're right. It's like love transforms all love actually is the shift. And, and I love that you said that too, because even in my own family, without getting like heavy into all the things like I've gone through, I have had to make the shift because nobody else will. And I've had to mm -hmm. Go through my own anger, go through my own sadness, go through all of that of being the black sheep of my family and to just come into love. And that's been such an embodiment for me and practice of like, even though I'm called crazy, even though things may look a certain way to them one way, I don't allow one those thoughts to take my thoughts anymore. And I also am just sending love back into that relationship over and over again to allow them to come into how they need to and to let mm -hmm. me move forward and shift further mm -hmm. versus being in conflict, which I was for quite some time. And, and the anger that you spoke to and, you know, and that depression that so many of us think go through, especially in the matrix, right? Where everything is polarizing and everything is, you know, this is right. This is wrong. You know, this is what this is. This is what's happening. We're, we're put into that for a reason. And, and I love that you speak to so much of the oneness because I truly believe that is where we are headed and where we are going. Yeah. What is shifting massively right now, which is why we see so much of this corruption and the systems falling and collapsing because it's meant to, right? It's, it's the mm -hmm. collapse of these old thoughts, these old ideas, this, this falseness, this non-truth. And like you said, truth holds so much weight, so much power because it is the truth love holds so much because it is the highest frequency there is. So I just thank you for sharing so much of your heart and your vulnerability and, and your teachings here. It's such a powerful conversation. I know my audience and community is going to just love it and be able to take away, you know, just something, if not, I hope you're all taking notes, honestly, <laughs> uh, that are listening, because <laughs> uh, he gave so many gems of, you know, what Aaron said, but, you know, before I let you go, Aaron, I'll tell you where, of course, you know, they can find you and everything. Tell me, what would be one thing you would leave us with when it comes to understanding the being in relationship and how they could make that just something that they practice each day? Especially I have a lot of moms, a lot of parents. I tell my clients all the time, like, I am human. I make mistakes. I blow up. Like, you know, like I am not by any means this enlightened person all day long. I am surely working on it. But, it, you know, as a busy 
entrepreneur and mother of three little ones and a husband and many things that are on my plate, uh, you know, that I'm very grateful are on my plate, but, you know, are part of my busy world. I make mistakes, you know, and I, I do come back to this embodiment. I do come back to this practice of love, but I'm curious for you, what you would share, especially for those listening, what would be one way, you know, each day that they could start to do this as they start to notice more and more that they need to be in loving relationship with something? Mm -hmm. Well, you're asking great questions, Allie. I'll give you that. <laughs> so, you know, Ra says in the law of one that there are no mistakes. You know, you mentioned like, I'll make a mistake and, and come back to embodiment. And that's totally honest to say that. But in a larger, like, spiritual sense, there aren't any mistakes because everything's a lesson to be learned. And so like, you know, if you gave a, a third grader a trigonometry uh, test and they sit there and you're like, here, solve this problem. And they like scribble a drawing on it, a doodle. Would you say, oh, the student made a mistake. Like it, it kind of doesn't apply, right? You're like, it, they can't even make a mistake because they don't even know what trigonometry is. <laughs> they don't even know what algebra is. Like they can't make a mistake in that sense. That's how the divine sees all of us in that every mistake we make, we had to make it because we don't fully see the truth yet. So in this framework of relationships, I'll give you your, your audience one more gem since we're on the topic. So this comes up a lot in my 40 university calls of people say like, this is really helping me, but I'm not always sure if I'm doing it because there's nuances, right? Like you brought up um, being around people whose energy is really off and maybe they are trying to use us or something. Does love just say, no problem, use me. I'm just, uh, I'm here for you to do whatever you want. Well, obviously not because, you know, uh, what would you want to say? Like contributing to somebody's dysfunctional behavior isn't loving to them ultimately. So if I like, if I get thrown into a strip club and I say, Hey, uh, this isn't my energy. I'm not, I'm not interested in being here. Um, no judgment towards anybody here. It's just not my scene. It's not my energy. And I walk out, nobody would say that's so hateful of you, Aaron. Well, maybe some people would, <laughs> but you know, nobody in the spiritual space would say that's so hateful. You should go back in there and be loving to those people by accepting where they are in their strip club desires. Nobody would say that, right? It's it's recognized that it's totally valid to not want to be somewhere. It doesn't mean I'm rejecting the people who are in there. It doesn't mean I'm judging them. I love them. They're just as valid as anyone else, but that's not my energy. I don't want to be involved in that energy. So it's loving to me to leave and it's loving to them to let them be as they are, right? I'm not asking anybody to change. I'm just leaving. So that's an extreme example, but can you extrapolate that to that conversation with your maybe more unconscious friend who wants to gossip or wants to talk about how much they're a victim. And you just don't want to feed those lies anymore and agree with their lies because you see them as something higher and more divine than that. So how do you, what's love do in that situation? Do you ignore them? Do you say, I stop talking? You know, how does love behave? So here's the framework that I give. A relationship is giving and receiving a loving relationship. And really giving and receiving are the same thing. We can see this easily with any relationship we have that's loving. Um, even this conversation we're having, right? For you to just listen to me and be like present with what I'm saying, you're giving me a gift. Like by receiving my words, you're giving me the gift of feeling heard. So you're, you're giving and you're receiving at the same time. And um, because I'm receiving your listening, you're, you're attentive, you're listening, you ask me a question, I receive that by then returning my answer, that's giving as well. So we're both really giving and receiving to each other at the same time. And that's what the Course, uh, course in Miracles says, that uh, the law of love says that giving and receiving are the same thing. So when you bless somebody else, you bless them, but you're also blessed by your service, right? We always feel joyful when we make someone else happy. When we bless somebody else, it feels so good and expansive. So you also receive the gift that you give, yeah? So in God's thought system, everybody wins. Yeah, everyone's a winner, nobody's a loser. Giving and receiving are one. So that's loving relationship, giving and receiving. Your receiving of anyone or anything is your acceptance of the present moment as it is. It's your acceptance of that person as they are. 
It's your ability to be present, right? When life brings you a situation, maybe it's a challenging situation. Maybe um, a big bill comes in the mail. If you go into resistance mode, oh, why is this happening? This is so unfair. You've just stepped out of receiving, right? You're not receiving the moment life is giving to you. So instead, to, to remain in receivership is to say, okay, thank you, life, for this catalyst. This is a lesson you're, you're here to teach me. I'm here to learn the lesson. Uh, show me how to handle this bill. You know, you just, you stay in that state of acceptance. That's receiving. And then likewise, giving is much more obvious, which is just be of service, be in service, be giving to creation all the time. If nothing else, just give loving thoughts to creation. Just give, 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 service. So that's God's thought system, right? Giving and receiving. And that's all relationships in the universe, the planets, uh, the elements of the earth, like everything in the universe is giving and receiving, giving and receiving, right? As soon as you cut off the flow of giving and receiving, death is the result, right? When something stops giving and receiving in the body, we call that disease and it quickly leads to death. So giving and receiving is life, right? The flow of life. So taking that understanding, what is the ego's version of giving and receiving? I like to call it taking and keeping. Ego wants to take and it wants to withhold, right? If it has something good, it doesn't want to give it. It wants to keep it to itself. That's um, a special relationship, right? With a romantic partner. No one else is allowed to look at my girl, tell her that she's beautiful, tell me she's beautiful. Like, don't you talk about my girl like that? It's this possessiveness, right? She belongs to me. So really, she's more like your slave than your lover, but you can't see that or recognize that yet. So the easiest way to know, to me at least, if I'm in loving relationship is to ask that question of what mode am I in right now? Am I in giving and receiving or am I in taking and keeping? And if you can just pay attention to when ego sucks you back into that taking and keeping, that selfishness, what can I take from others to get happiness? What can I withhold to keep happiness? When you notice you're in that mode, that's a huge victory because you're catching ego in the moment as it's functioning and saying, ah, there it is. It's like you're picking up the scent of the ego, right? And then you say, let me just return to giving and receiving. So again, only what I don't give can ever be lacking. So whatever I'm trying to take from the universe, let me start giving it. Let me make someone else happy. Let me make someone else feel loved. And that's the medicine that begins to polarize our consciousness towards the light. And it's just the simplest framework I've discovered, Ali, for remaining in unity consciousness. If you're just paying attention to your state of being and making sure you're always receiving from life, whatever life does, I say yes to it. I resist nothing. I'm always receiving what life is giving. And then you're always also in giving at the same time. Who can I bless? Who can I serve? How can I help? Um, that is the state of unity consciousness and it has to be practiced, but as you practice it every day, it eventually becomes natural and just like a default mode. And you actually start to forget how you ever lived in taking and keeping like, wow, what a, what a horrible state of consciousness to live in. Um, how did I, how did I do that for so long? Like giving and receiving is so wonderful and brings so much happiness. Yeah, I love that. I have to say thank you for that perspective shift that kind of zoom out, zoom in when you said about, you know, that when I said the mistake, you're right, it, it is so true. It, it is the lesson. And there is always growth. And there is always evolution if we're allowing ourselves to see it and have that self awareness. And I also love that you spoke to too, of course, that, you know, that that giving and, and, and receiving and that true flow. And you're right, it's so expansive, you feel it, you know, it, when you're in it, you, you're experiencing it when, you know, you're blessing someone, you're experiencing it when you're sharing from your heart and you're having conversations that light you up, you know? Yeah. So I, I just, I, I love how you shifted even that for me, you know? And I think that's another thing too, is like in these moments, understanding when we're on these journeys of like, Hey, there's always more to learn. There's always more to evolve. There's always more to see and experience and, and, and grow in this. Right. Mm -hmm. So and that's I, what makes it fun. Right. Yes, exactly. That's what makes it fun. And also like, you're not bypassing anything, right? Like how you said, like, I don't have any resistance. I allow myself. Yes, Abel. I allow myself not to resist. I just allow things to happen. And I take that as a lesson that it is and allow the growth and allow the evolution. Just, just beautiful. And I just thank you yeah. so much for just sharing your heart and your vulnerability and just all you're doing truly to be of service in that collective. I love 
following you and listening to your teachings. And I very much appreciate, you know, your friendship and just your sharing here and the gifts you gave my community and everything. So tell us where they can find you or can follow you all be in the show notes, but go ahead and, and just share that. Yeah. Well, thank you for the kind words and um, likewise to everything you said. Um, for me, it's really easy. I do the same the same link everywhere. It's just Aaron Abke. So at Aaron Abke, AaronAbke.com, YouTube.com slash Aaron Abke. That's where you'll find me. Um, but if you want to look more into my programs that I mentioned, you can go to 4duniversity.com and you can read more about them there. Amazing. It'll all be in the show notes, you guys. So, you know, Aaron, thank you again so much for being here. We'll have to have another conversation together. I love this. And everyone, love, light, and blessings. Take these teachings and put them into your everyday life and be embodied. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Sally.